so I've, I've first been asked to talk a bit about uh, how I kind of became interested in this topic and what my background is. And uh, I'll then also ask, ask Susie to kind of reflect a bit on, on the same questions. So um, I started my career off as a researcher. I have been a researcher for seven years. And it's also in the research environment that I actually, for the first time, was confronted with um, maybe actually, I should say, a lack of diversity and, and the issues around that. And uh, so in the last two years, I've actually kind of re-transitioned my career to this area and actually from the perspective of regulation and policy, both at the government level, but also in institutions and in organizations, and how regulation can actually help to change, um, to change some of the challenges I've talked about in terms of diversity, inclusivity, leadership. Um, I started actually off uh, working on the research culture program of the Royal Society in this direction, and this was very much focused uh, around changing culture in research environments in particular. And now I am continuing to work on research policy in the Royal Society of Chemistry. And I also, with my former colleague from the Royal Society, uh, founded Meetis Talk, which is a platform for people to discuss, debate, test ideas around cultural change, specifically in research environments. And I think with that background, I'm coming probably from quite a complementary uh, angle um, compared, to, compared to Susie. And Susie, I'd like to also ask you, um, how have you edged into this topic? How did you become interested? And also, how, how did this become a career for you? Because I think that's really um, what, it, what it is now as well. Accidentally is the answer. No. Um, uh, lovely to see you all this afternoon. Uh, so how did I get started in inclusion and diversity? I joined a global management consulting firm in 1999 after um, university, and I did so because I found all of my internships with international companies quite boring, if I'm honest, because I started to have to redo the same thing over and over again. So I landed in consulting just because I wanted something new all the time. And for the first five or seven years of my career, I did things like launch the Xbox for Microsoft and put new systems in for Dell computer, really technical things, a big bank merger. And actually, I had absolutely nothing to do with diversity. In fact, whenever there was an invite that said, come talk about diversity, I kind of went the other way. And the reason I did was my first interaction with it, and it was in 1999, and A, we didn't talk about diversity back then in the way that we do today. It wasn't a common topic. But I went to my first event, and they talked about babies and nannies and how hard my career was going to be, and I was just like, I don't, I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know if I want those children that you're talking about. And, and I walked away because it was well-intended but really badly executed. So it wasn't until um, much later on when I moved to the UK, I started on the people side of things on the side of my desk. And I did so because we had some bullying that was happening in the office, quite frankly. And I, I stepped in and decided that we could be different and act differently. And then I started owning things around other people stuff. And my boss said, I want you to own diversity too. And I was like, oh no, not me. And um, so reluctantly is the answer. And that doesn't tell you how I got all the way. That, that was 15, 16 years ago now. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to tell you more about how that changed. But I think ultimately I found it the most complex problem that I've ever faced. So going back to my desire to have really good problem solving, when I got into the inclusion and diversity space, in particular racial inclusion, uh, mental health, and gender, I, I found my perfect never-ending problem to solve, and I, I absolutely love it now. So, Especially when a company is in a challenging situation, there is a real benefit of having a more diverse team, especially in such a situation. It seems like at moments where decision-making is most important, you benefit the most from having uh, a diverser team. And I wanted to ask, just from your experience from working uh, with organizations, mm. Is that something that resonates with you also from your own experience? 
Yes, although I'm going to caveat some of what you said. So their desire to leave a legacy and then looking at it and going, just because that's the way it is, that's not how the way I want it to be when I leave this place. Usually, that's the reason they do something. It's not because research suggests. On your point about when, a, when an organization is in its worst moment, it needs diversity, I'm not sure I agree. So, and, and let me tell you why. Um, I think diversity is one of, one of the most critical topics of kind of a modern era, but it's not the only topic. So mm -hmm. I've got clients who, I have one client who's been losing money for nine years. It's quite significantly, and they've been doing restructuring, their market is shrinking, they're having to let employees go. And we're looking at their diversity strategy and they're going, it just doesn't feel like the right time. Now, it's not that they're not gonna do anything about diversity, but I think when we put diversity out here and we don't tie it to reality, if you're not gonna have a job tomorrow, we can't be coming to you saying we need this place to be incredibly diverse, wouldn't it be wonderful if? Because the employees are saying, I won't have a paycheck next week. Let's be real about where mm -hmm. we're at. So, and that's an extreme example, but I think when we talk about diversity without being grounded in the reality of all the other things going on for an organization, we miss out a little bit because um, people, there's a Maslow hierarchy of needs and diversity is, and inclusion is part of that, but you gotta eat, you gotta have a job, you gotta have safety, and if those things aren't taken care of, we can't get to the inclusion part um, of, of the hierarchy. Yeah, and I think you already just mentioned the term inclusion there. Um, there are companies where both principles, inclusivity, and I think that's probably a necessity. You need to be inclusive to have diversity mm. work for you. Because mm. if you have a whole range of people with different backgrounds and different experiences, but they don't all feel included and feel mm. empowered to contribute, obviously your diversity isn't really going to be your benefit. No. So they kind of need to go hand in hand. And I think what you also referred to is in some situations, if they're not established as principles for a company, mm. they need really a cultural change. And there are maybe situations where, you know, that's just not combinable with some of the other challenges the company yeah. is going through. Uh, so just to come, to come back on that concept of the link between diversity and inclusivity, can you yeah. maybe go a bit more in detail on sure. how, you know, those need to go hand in hand sure. and how it's really important to have both? Um, I think it is really important to have both. In all honesty, 10 years ago when I started working in this space, I didn't even know what the word inclusion was. So we've learned a lot in a decade. And I often get, I, I get calls from usually the CEO or the CFO or some C-level person who wants to make change in the organization. And usually there's a, there's a murmur about we really want diversity of thought. What we really need is that diversity of thought. And that's their end game, fairness, for sure, but diversity of thought. And one of the equations that I've played with over time is, um, I don't think you can get to diversity of thought if you're not diverse in the first place. So if you have an all white workforce, or very male workforce, or only UK centric workforce, or you know, whatever, you're, you've got too much of one thing, you're just not diverse in the first place. But per your point, if you can't create a hotbed of inclusion, what happens is you shut down those voices. So nobody wants to hear your difference. Thanks for your great idea, but we didn't want it. And actually, I see a lot of this in private sector. If you work in one industry and, and you only hire from that industry, you'll think that nobody has any good ideas unless they came from your industry. Mm -hmm. So there will be a real, uh, not invented here, no, that just really wouldn't work. So you've got to have that level of inclusion, A, for people to raise ideas and flourish and be themselves. But you have to be willing to want what they're going to bring you. You can't just buy in diversity and then hope it all works out in the end. There's a lot of work that ha groundwork that has to be done mm, to definitely, create inclusion. Definitely. Uh, actually, just a question came through on um, diversity of thought, and someone that is asking about, you know, if you want to see whether you're actually being successful in some of these measures, how would you measure diversity, diversity of thought? Of thought? Uh, and, and there's a note with it saying, you know, um, you, have, you might have people that really look different from each other, uh, and sometimes it might be very hard to unlock the potential of the, the diversity. You know, how, how do you measure progress in, in that? That's a great question. I, I think 
you have to start first with are we all like each other and not just do we all look like each other but um, some of the government work I do I'll find that the lack of diversity is social inclusion so everybody had a first degree from a top university um, and therefore we're missing a whole echelon of society so I think first you have to go do we have the right voices in the room <coughs> And sometimes it's not so easy to put the right voices in the room, especially when you're dealing in a, in a senior setting. Um, so if you can't, then sometimes it's just bringing in their voice through a different mechanism. So some of my clients, we create customer councils where the customer council is as diverse as all the potential customers in the UK or around the world. And then we get the right kind of ideas because you can't always hire in like one person from Brazil one from Germany and one from here and have it all necessarily work in every organization. I think ultimately for diversity of thought you have to be measuring the the outcomes that they, they're creating mm -hmm. uh, and the, the idea generation and how different it could be from today and unfortunately when organizations are doing really well and I think Cambridge sometimes is guilty of this <laughs> um, why would we change anything we're amazing so if, if you have a depth of thinking of that we are the best in the world, there's a hesitance to want to, we shouldn't, it's all working, why would we want to change it? And unfortunately, that's a, that's a mentality that will um, come back to haunt you later on uh, for a number of reasons that I'd be happy to go into. But um, I think measuring that outcome in terms of how different can we think and how much can we foresee the future rather than just our success of today. And we see that in marketplaces. Transferwise, um, the global head of banking who was talking earlier, they have disrupted that marketplace. Mm -hmm. And you know how they did it? Two guys decided to transfer money to each other because they didn't want to pay the fees. So how about I give you my US dollars and you give me your euros and let's just make a simple little fee and let's cut the banks out of it. That's diversity of thought, not going, look at all the regulation, this is mm. never going to work. Uh, there are lots of different ways that you can do it. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to come back a bit to the point about diversity specifically in, in leadership and how once it's established and if it's established at the, at the right time, it can be very par powerful. Um, because I, I feel like most people start to acknowledge that diversity is a positive thing or can be a positive mm. thing, yet we seem to not succeed in mm. having diversity in leadership teams, yep. having diversity in leadership in general, in policy, in, I mean, name an area, and I think, yep. you know, there is, there is a lack of diversity in probably almost every industry. So, you know, why is it not working if we know <laughs> this is our direction of travel. What is, or maybe also what are the things that are already working and may, maybe leading us to, to small steps of progress and what are things that are really holding us back from holding your experience? Back. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, things that are working and things that are holding us back. I, I think one of, the, one of the fundamental things that gets skipped is the question why. Hmm. So if we take gender diversity and we are talking mostly gender diversity today, if we look across almost every country in the world, or every element of society, men rise to the top. Today in the G20, 18 out of the 20 are men, and pretty soon it'll be 19 out of the 20. If we look, you know, heads of state, you just CEOs, I can begin, we can talk business, we can talk politics, we can talk sport, my goodness, you could be paid a whole lot more, you could rise to the top. So why are men rising to the top everywhere? It's a really great question. And, and I think we don't stop enough to say why. So are they better than women? And then that has to be the question, part of the question. It's a really uncomfortable question. But are men better at this than women? Are they? No, they're not. So why? So if they're not better, but sometimes they're different, so why are men rising to the top? And I don't think all of it is about so that we can talk about bias in a little bit, but we don't stop and say, if, do we fundamentally believe men are better? And most people in their heart of hearts go, no. Maybe we're different, but we're not better. They're not better. But then we go, so what is the root cause? What are the root causes? And the first thing I hear is babies. <laughs> and you're like, oh, going back to my 21-year-old self. And unfortunately, I meet lots of executives of, you know, private sector, public sector, third sector organizations who automatically think babies are the problem. 
but they have almost no data to suggest babies are the problem. So we, we, we guess as to why, rather than go back to the root causes. Um, and I can, that, so that's one of the issues, is start with the why, get to the root causes. I think the second thing is, we treat diversity as this kind of, oh yeah, we definitely want it, so let's let a thousand flowers bloom, lots of ideas, um, but we don't treat, treat it as a strategic program. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, we don't always give it the right level of executive sponsorship, the right level of budget, and um, when we start talking about, quote, targets, we freak out. We go, oh my gosh, we can't have a target because then we're harming men. Um, and actually, if we took the word diversity away and we aimed for something, uh, really good uh, business sense would say, you have a target. You measure your intent. You try. You aim for something. You don't, you don't kind of scattergun the effort. So I think diversity, there was a fairly amateurish approach to it for a long time, mm -hmm. rather than doing a real serious approach. I would say also we messed up the narrative immensely by excluding men. So when we look at gender diversity, we were like, women are the future. And imagine how that feels for the men in the room. What does that mean? What, you're the past? There's no future for you? I mean, that's wrong. That's just not the right narrative. What we created was this argument between men and women. If you win, women, then men have to lose. And it doesn't have to be that way, by the way. And there are, we didn't look at gender and say, what do men need? And they have a lot of needs. Mm -hmm. So men commit suicide almost two to one around the world to women. In LATAM countries, there are more than eight countries where it's four to one, men taking their own lives. Global alcoholism is two to one. Men are twice as likely to be alcoholics than women. They are 95% of the UK prison population, 92% of the US prison population. And we have all these social problems for boys and men that we don't talk about. Today, a global campaign through the Rugby World Cup, if you're a rugby fan, uh, launched today about suicide, about helping men begin to open up and talk about their feelings. You have feelings. You need to be hugged <laughs> without getting all American huggy on you. Um, but my point is, we, we made the narrative, it's all about women, and we're going to fix the world for women, and women are the future, and we left men behind. And if we... When we re-architect that and balance the conversation and balance our actions, we get a lot more progress a lot quicker and everybody wins. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason. Yeah. And there are lots of good things you can do to speed things up. Yeah. I can keep going. I will, I'll pause there. <laughs> I'll ask more questions, I promise. Okay. Uh, no, I'm, I think it is clear that inclusivity is a good thing for, for everyone. And actually, I have an, an interesting question um, coming in um, from here in the audience or, or somewhere else in the world, saying, do you think that the corporate market is ready for diverse leaders to have more women, LGBT people in high level positions? Absolutely. I really do believe it's ready. Um, I think there are a tranche of leaders who are making phenomenal progress and they've, they've figured out why this matters to their marketplace and to their customers. And when you begin looking at it it's right for your employees, but it, when it's right for your marketplace, you start winning on it. And they are becoming more diverse more quickly. And the success of uh, lesbian women, gay men, black men, Hispanic women are rising in those organizations. But they are the early, maybe not even the early adopters, because I think some of the early adopters made some of the bigger mistakes. So they're the tranche behind the early adopters. They're the Microsofts. I'm going to steal a good idea and make it amazing, if you're going to say. Um, and they're doing phenomenal. So, but I also think the marketplace is ready. Um, I, I watch different uh, views on how important diversity is to boards, board level conversations. And four years ago, out of a list of 10 issues, it was ninth. So diversity and inclusion was ninth in terms of board level expectation and shareholder expectation. Today, it's number one by a mile, by a large margin. And it's number one uh, not only because social expectations are changing, but we've uncovered some pretty ugly stuff. Some high-profile figures have done some things which are now coming into light. And we mm -hmm. live in a world where social media can connect those things, and we can say, no, nope, not anymore. And so there's a, there's a course correction happening, which mm -hmm. is speeding up the pace where people who maybe weren't bought into being the early adopter or even the second tranche are going, oh, we better get going on that. Yeah. 
and I think you're just you're, you're just going to see that increase with um, in great intensity. Yeah. So I think we've established it's important. I think we've established the world is ready for it. So I think it's some it's, of the world. <laughs> some of the world. Um, some of the world. But that's that's a start. So I, I think it's good to, to zoom in. Actually, on... can can I add one thing? I think when we talk about the world rather than corporate, I see the a couple of things happening. You've got activists trying to change the world. Uh, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, you've got these programs and activism happening. And that's maybe 10 to 15% mm. of the population. And then you've got, you've got people really trying to stop it from happening. You, you've got some sexism, homophobia, racism that's really ingrained. And maybe again that's 10% if I round up of the population. So let's say it's 10% and 10%, you've got 80% in the middle. And that middle will figure out our future. The people who think diversity is not their job, mm -hmm. the one who is not the CEO, right? They're, 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 they're not just middle management. But most of them are sitting not doing very much. And they kind of think having tolerance is inclusion, mm -hmm. but they don't really take any action. So to your point, are we ready? I think there will be a tranche of people who will always push back. And there will always be a group of leaders trying to make us go faster. The question becomes what the average person does. Mm -hmm. That will tell us whether it takes five or 10 years or 250 years to change some of the things we're talking about in terms of race or sexual orientation, gender. And yeah, and according to the UN, for if we just talk about gender equality, we're looking to get there worldwide at another 170, I think. so. Um, it's probably good to talk about of some of the things we can start doing because I think if we can already get everyone here on board, that's um, a start. And so I'm going to come back to one of the things you mentioned that people say it's about. And I'm going to come back to babies, but I'm going to kind of broaden it out to paid and unpaid work. And you know, um, it is true that women are still doing most of the unpaid work in, work in the world, but also most of the homework, more, most of the care work. Yeah. And of course, you know, if you're putting your own resources somewhere, you'll have less to compete you know, in the yeah. workplace. So I think this is, this is one, of the, um, one of the things definitely that is, that is still important to look at. And I think globally, women are still doing 2.5 times yeah the amount of household work that men do. So mm. obviously it's not something, something we can ignore. Um, what, is, what are kind of the lessons around that, that that you've taken from the work you've done or what are the things you talk about to organizations in this context? Um, I'm going to jokingly say this, but in uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book on Lean In, uh, one of the things she recommended was marry well, ladies. <laughs> marry a man who will do half the cooking and half the cleaning and half of the childcare. I, and that is my personal recommendation. <laughs> and I adore my husband and we, everything's 50-50 in our household, but that's taken a lot, a lot of work. And so women do do more, and that is clear. And I call that phenomenon, um, I want equality, but I don't want equal laundry. Guys, you gotta do more laundry. Like, you gotta do more laundry. And you gotta do more of those things. And, and even Ariel, the brand, the, you know the brand Ariel, a global brand, they launched a whole series of commercials in India trying to get men to do more domestic work because the imbalance is more like 10 to one in, ter in, in an yeah. average Indian house. Um, and it, it's, a, it's an honest phenomenon that women do take more of this role. Now, women take more of the role because we saw our moms do it, for sure. Um, not so many of us had dual working families, although I did. My mom earned more than my dad, even though they were both blue collar workers. Um, but she also did a lot more of the cleaning and domestic work than my dad did. So we, women have to be careful not to fall into the pattern of just because our moms did it, we will do it. And also we have to create space for men. And this comes from when we have children too. I see a lot of women uh, naturally take over and don't create a space for a, a man to go do that. Mm -hmm. especially with kids, and, and what happens, at, w shared parental leave is an example of that. In the UK, we have um, a law that says you can share the first, well, not the first two weeks, but the subsequent 50 weeks you can share between men and women. And a lot of the women at the organization I worked for when we launched shared parental leave were like, I don't want to give my maternity leave up to men. Mm -hmm. Why would I give it up to him? 
And it does require us going, do I want to give it up to him? Actually, we have a lot of stats that show what happens in the first year of a child's life replicates for 20 years. So if you take, women take all the time off and you order all the groceries, you do all the housework and you do all the baby, the probability is that will never rebalance itself. And in fact, I read an amazing book about relationships after children that someone gave me when I had my first child. And, and they recommended that when you, if you were a working mom, that you, when you went back to work, you rebalanced everything. So I wrote down everything I was doing and then including ordering groceries, and when the day I went back to work, my husband assumed 50% of all of that. We were back on 50-50. So, so that's, that's one of the ways. Um, I really do think we have to change the narrative for boys too, yeah. the expectation. We still have a societal norm in most countries around the world. In LATAM, it, I'd say it's even more exacerbated on what masculinity is. Historic view. Well, my, my dad bragged that he never changed a diaper or a nappy in his life. That's awful. Sorry, Dad. Um, but he's, he's of a different generation, but we're going to have to engage boys in terms of what kind of father do you want to be? What kind of husband do you want to be? And to what extent are you going to step into that role when we get things like shared parental leave, which give you the opportunity? Yeah. And laundry. The laundry basket doesn't require legal changes <laughs> for you to wash it by the way. So that's an easy one. Uh, oh, can I add one more thing? I, I also sure. think, um, sorry, there's a really good study also that women, um, we have a tendency to set an expectation in a, in a really different way than men will do. And I'm going to give you a great British London example of this. So your children get invited to parties for a birthday party. And you might send them along, and you need to make sure that the present went to the party or something like that. And I saw a couple, who I know very well, get in a major argument because he forgot the present for the birthday party. I bought the present. It was all right. How could you forget the present? And I remember taking her aside and going, Caroline, the present doesn't matter, right? Like, you're really mad because you got the present. But I don't think the four-year-old <laughs> noticed <laughs> that there wasn't a present at the party. So we have this tendency to set social expectation that our children will look nice, that the gift will be there, that the table will be set, that the house will be perfect, and that we will look good in society. And I think women have to lessen that a little bit. We've got to let ourselves have a little bit of, mm -hmm. this is not going to change world peace <laughs> if she has ketchup on her dress in public. So I, I think women also have to kind of Mm -hmm. relax a little bit on our social norms. So part of it is definitely changing expectations, and I'm going to come back to that point. But just, just to kind of go a bit deeper on the shared parental leave, actually in preparation of this event, Shaping Horizons, there was a, a women and, and a global leadership forum mm -hmm. here in Cambridge that I also attended, and shared parental leave is actually one of the things I there really wanted to talk about. Um, and I talked about the Scandinavian and Iceland ex examples where I think in Iceland 90% 90, 90 of men already mm -hmm. take shared parental leave. And one of the, the, the UK leaders uh, present said, yeah, we tried in the UK, it's not working. And I, mm -hmm. I felt like have we really? Because yeah. I think the policy in the UK was implemented from 2015. And I think Scandinavia has been on this for you know, over 40 years. Yes. Uh, but I also feel it's not only, as you said, about regulation. There's also really a culture and a stigma that has to change. Is that for something sure. yes, you know, you've, for sure. you've felt? And, and is there a difference between different countries? Uh, if we think about, you know, w would, these, would these kind of policies be easier to accept in some places than others, do you think? And um, how's, how is the UK in, in, in that? So and maybe Latin America as well? No, no, that's a, that's a good a question. So shared parental leave introduced four years ago. Um, only, just so I can explain the policy and then we can talk about the mm. behaviors around it, you're, you're allowed to share the 52 weeks of leave at statutory government pay, which is £136 a week. Mm. And not very many people, including students, actually you might be able to tell us how to live on £136 a week, but the, but the average person in the UK can't live on £136 a week. So the government put in the law to, to and, and often laws are what I would call a sledgehammer. They're an imperfect solution, but they break open an opportunity. So what we saw happen is where companies did nothing, 
Organizations, employers did nothing. Almost no men took it. Mm. It was really rare, and the man had to fight for it. But there's a group of leading companies who equalized pay, and they equalized at full salary between 14 and 39 weeks. So some companies in the UK pay their men up to 39 weeks full pay for shared parental leave, and then all the way down kind of to the 14 week. Those companies are seeing between 15 and 40% uptake. And the companies who are more towards the 40% uptake are where they've created social behavioral programs. So they role model dads who took time off three, four, five months to be the primary carer with their children because they realized that social stigma was gonna hold men back. Mm -hmm. Because in the UK, and I think it is as bad, potentially worse in LATAM, um, men are less than, so there are less than 20% primary school teachers in the UK who are men. There are less than 10% or right around 10% male <laughs> nurses in the UK. So when we see a profession of looking after children, men don't do it. It's not considered okay. And being a, a dad who takes time off has that same stigma. Yeah. We generally look at men in the UK who like to spend time with children and think there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. We associate really negative stereotypes with men who would like to spend time with children. And we've got to change that. So it was only the companies who, or, or employers, who did something above and beyond to reduce the stigma, <coughs> to change the monetary percentage. Because quite frankly, if you were only getting paid 136 a week, versus somebody who's gonna get full pay in the couple, you know which decision you'd make. You're never gonna make the 136 a week decision, you're gonna make the full pay decision. You can't leave money on the table, mm -hmm. um, especially in dual working families when it's so hard in, a, in the modern world. So I think shared parental leave is imperfect in the way that it, the legislation was rolled out, but it paved the way for opportunity. And I studied, um, both the Nordics, uh, three countries in the Nordics and Canada who had similar models and saw how long it took in those countries for shared parental situations to work. And also there were flaws in the early legislation. So for example, I know in one of the countries, men were using their opportunity for shared parental leave to have extra summer holiday for an extended period of time. And so legally, they brought in a law to say, you have to be the primary carer and it's only for you if you lose it. So nobody got it perfect right time, therefore shared parental leave isn't perfect, but it's the opening of an awesome opportunity yes. that we need to continue to unpick. And we've learned a lot already, so that's, yes. that's a good start. Um, we've kind of, this is probably more seen as a, as a gender issue, and I'm getting a few questions also um, about um, how to promote to have more inclusion of trans people, uh, LGBTQ plus in general, um, you know, why are they so underrepresented in, um, in leadership? What are some of their specific challenges? And I want to kind of broaden it out because I, I know we, we only have a few minutes left to particular challenges mm. to some of these different groups we've been talking about mm. in the workplace. So both L LGBT community, uh, gender and Older minorities, ethnic minorities. Can can we just maybe spend the last few minutes talking about, yeah. you know, what are what are their particular challenges, mm -hmm. both just being in the workplace, I guess, but also getting to kind of the, the leadership uh, positions. Um, how about if I talk about uh, sexual yeah, orientation, <laughs> LGBT, and race? We'll do those two as a start. Um, when it comes to sexual orientation, we have made a lot of progress in a lot of countries around the world. Um, We've seen more pace of progress, things like gay marriage referendums in different countries. But we're still looking at it being punishable to be gay by imprisonment or by death in 80 countries around the world. So when we sit in London or in the UK, we think, wow, this is phenomenal, we've done amazing. Um, that's a very heterosexual way to look at the world. If you ask your gay friends about where they're going on a holiday, there'll be a number of places they're not going or they're not going and they're not being themselves. And given how global business is, how global education is, I think those of us who are heterosexual need to understand the realities and the threat that still exists to living life as you are. Um, I was uh, helping uh, on stage in a government forum about a year ago 
And someone from the Foreign Office said to me, I don't know what to do. I've got a woman who wants to be posted in the Middle East. She's openly lesbian. She's married to her wife. She's been out for 15 years here in, in London, but we can't put her back in the closet as she goes there, and it will be a threat to her life, and yet I don't want to hold her career back. So what's my decision as a global leader? Do I let her go and try and put safety mechanisms around her? Or do I tell her I can't in all great honesty? So that, that's a tough example when we look at global. I think when we look at local, it, even if we're talking about the UK, where we think we have acceptance, most of us don't really understand what it's like to be editing all the time and omitting parts of ourselves. So I get a lot of people who don't know. So it's OK that they're gay or lesbian or bisexual, but what's that got to do with the workplace or the classroom? And the answer is a lot, because you bring yourself. The more we know, and go back to your studies, the, the more you can be yourself, we know the more you flourish at work or at school, etc. So we have a lot of work to do, even in our, quote, progressed areas, and just to create a space where people can be themselves more quickly, and they spend less time editing. I think when it comes to racial inclusion, we have more to go than any of the other areas. And mm. One of the reasons we have more to go is people are afraid to talk about race. <coughs> Incredibly afraid to talk about race. They'll talk about culture or how amazing food is. I love the food from your country. <laughs> um, but actually talking about what it's like to be an ethnic minority, to be Latino or Latino or black or Asian, and um, most white people can't say the word black without fear of being seen as being racist. We didn't start these social conversations at the right age. So what happens in, in employer situations, in business, I find race is the lowest rung of the diversion, a diversity agenda because people are just afraid of it and they don't know where to start. So even helping create cultural competence and going, well, we start somewhere. And we also start by getting it wrong. So one thing I've learned as a white person working in race is I've put my foot in it over and over again over a 10-year period. But every time someone has course corrected me and said, you know what, let me explain something. And then I never did it again. And I learned. And I grew from it. And I didn't die. Right? Like I'm still standing here. And now I'm much more competent and capable as a leader when it comes to creating racial inclusion. And I think we need to, we need a lot more of that yeah. across the world, in the US, the UK, in, in Latin. We have ethnic minorities everywhere, and our ability to include them in all aspects of society and talk about what it's really like is, is incredible, important. Yeah, and I, I think openness to those conversations for, for all, all of us is probably something we should really kind of try to be more vis visibly yeah. open to. Um, and, and I think we, we, we should finish. So I think that the last thing I would like to ask is like, other than all taking our responsibility in doing our bit of the laundry, what are the immediate <laughs> things we can all do to kind of make sure at least the culture we are part of, you know, improves? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I think it's uh, move from passive to active. So regardless of whichever part of diversity you're looking at, most of us take a passive role and let change be delivered by someone else. It will only change if we decide we want to change it. And every, I would say every person in this room or on the, on the webcast has a role, but you have to make a conscious choice. Nothing changes unless you choose to drive that change, to make the mistake, to figure out the way forward. So I would say move from passive, go and get think, active. And I think that's... Uh, Good to end. Thank you very much, Susie. Welcome.